Blessings, everyone. Welcome in. I'm Pastor Rob Johnson from Servant's Heart Worship Center, thanking you, as always, for checking out our website and our Facebook page and, and subscribing to our YouTube channel. You know, there's a lot of things happening in the world today, and most Christians don't realize that we're watching biblical prophecy being fulfilled. God said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And a lot of times people look at prophecy as all that old scary stuff in the Old Testament. But there's prophecy about this day, about the day we're living in, in both the Old and the New Testament. Numerous, numerous prophecies that we've watched come true. And when you think about the fact that it was two and four thousand years ago that these prophecies were spoken, that God spoke these words to the prophets, it's really amazing. So I hope you're hungry today spiritually because I'd like you to write down these scriptures, learn them, know them, and pass them along. Today is part two from last week's sermon build, uh, called Houseboat. It's about building an ark, a type of spiritual ark in our homes. And today is called Passing Down Prophecy. God bless you. Pray before you listen to the message, before you open your word. Phone a friend, and uh, I hope you enjoy this word. God bless you. Last week was Father's Day, and I, I gave a, a charge to the fathers to build a spiritual ark in their home, uh, meaning, uh, like Noah, to save his family. God required that he do exactly, follow his word exactly. And this is what God wants us to do in our homes as men and women. And part of that, Part of helping our kids build a biblical foundation is teaching them prophecy. See, I've never been, prophecy preachers were always, to me when I was a kid, I always thought they were kind of creepy because it was always like, oh, everything's bad. It's all going to end. And, and they'd get wound up because I didn't know. I didn't have the biblical knowledge then that I do now. Prophecy in today's world is one of the most important, if not the most important, aside from salvation and the gospel of Jesus Christ, things that we can pass down to our children. Part of building a spiritual ark in our home and passing things down to our kids so they can take and pass it down to their children and on through the generations, part of that is teaching them the truths, what the Bible says about today's world. Because throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, numerous, numerous scriptures about today, the times that we are living in right now. God said, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. And the only way that our children are going to get the knowledge is if we pass it down to them. Fathers, mothers, families, churches, if we pass the knowledge down to them, They'll know the signs to look for because it's going to get really dicey in the end times. The world is going to turn so dark spiritually that God says it will be as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be when the Son of Man returns. Those were dark times, void of God, making God so mad. You see what he puts up with today. Can you imagine making God so upset that he decides to wipe humanity off the face of the earth? We're coming back to that. We can see the birth pains of it in our societies all over the world. There's a turning away from God. And at the same time, the church has an obligation to show the full word of God, the truth of God's word. But so many places today are, are preaching pop, pop psychology and puff pieces because they want to have butts in the seat rather than souls in glory. Excuse my, my being blunt about it, but that's the truth. If we put on a good show and the people feel entertained, we've got everything taken care of in the church. Nobody has to do nothing. We don't have to have people volunteering for ministry. We don't have to have any of this stuff. You just come as you are. And that all sounds great. But it's not what the church was meant to do. The church is meant to give, not get. 
we get from our personal relationship from God and our own study. But when we come together as a church, we're to pour that out. We're to pour that out of our lives at work. We're to let people see the gospel of Jesus Christ in the way we live our lives. In the church, we come in and we serve one another. We serve God by serving one another. And it's something that's been lost upon this generation, I believe. And I think part of the problem is prophecy is not being preached from the pulpit too much anymore. But I felt led today. I've preached on America and Israel before, but I felt like God was calling me to bring something in today's word. Because I was thinking it's a perfect time to teach our children what the Bible says about the times we're living in. Because it's easy to see in today's world. It's clear. We can watch the news. We can see the headlines and watch the world and the way it's posturing and point directly to Scripture. And when you think about these prophecies, some of them are 2,000 years old, some of them are 4,000 years old. Going back to a time way before there were massive cities. Some of these prophecies are, are, are all of these prophecies, Old and New Testament, were at a time when the United States didn't even exist. It wasn't here. Europe hadn't been developed yet. You go back and you think about the dynamic prophecies that came from the Bible about a time to them, they couldn't see it. What are you talking about? What cities? What, what, what great kings? What cities are you talking about when you read biblical prophecy? But they saw it in their lifetime. Jesus even said, you've seen prophecy fulfilled. Jesus gave us prophecy for this generation to look at, to pass along to our children, as well as Peter and Paul. So that's what I want to talk about today because I believe that God is bringing it all into focus to show you and I as believers, to show the church. He's bringing it into focus to show the church that we have a greater responsibility than just coming and getting. We have a responsibility to bring, uh, for evangelism, bringing, which is bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world, leading others to Christ, and discipleship, which is getting ourselves more in tune with God and tightening up our relationship with God and making Him our, the primary focus of our lives, digging deeper, becoming stronger in faith and more knowledgeable in the Scriptures so we can teach our children so they can teach theirs. So let's pray together before we read uh, our Scripture this morning. And let's ask the Lord to reveal the truths and to, to bring a face into each of our minds that of somebody in our life that we know is lost, that God may be calling us to take the gospel to. Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for your glory. And Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, for the prophecy contained in your word that point us to the things that will happen. And I pray that today every heart will be open so we will know what to do in our little corner of the last days. And Father, I pray for churches all over America, all over the world, that as we see these things lining up according to your word, that we would point to it and remind people that you are God and that you said these things would come to pass. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. All right. The first prophecy I want to look at is from the New Testament. It's Peter's prophecy. Peter's prophesying about a future time, and the things he's describing were absolutely outrageous. That He's describing a society, and the, the people at that time are going, there's no way that something like that could ever happen. Let's read his words. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Most importantly, this is Peter writing, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers, 
will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. Now go down to verses 8 through 14. And this is his charge to us. But you, talking to Christians, but you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to, say that word together, repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. The heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. He's telling us that judgment is coming. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. He has promised a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, here we go. Here's the charge to us. Make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. He is saying in the last days, for all those in the future who are reading these words, he's saying that we should live our lives as though Jesus could come at any moment. I always say, live your life. Go after everything that God calls you to go after. The end times isn't a time for, it's not a time for Christians to hide in basements and stock up food. It's a time for us to be out there trying to win souls for Christ. So I always say, go after everything that God, want, that God calls you to go after and live your life. But what he's talking about here to Christians is that our lives, the way we live our lives, our conduct should be as though Christ could come at any moment. We need to be godly in our conduct, our lifestyle, and especially in our hearts. Because if we're godly in our hearts, God always works from the inside out. If we're godly in our hearts, then we will, it'll, it'll pour outward into our lives and we'll be godly people. It's time, I believe, that God is telling us that it's time to be prepared. It's time to get our house in order spiritually. It's time to be prepared to pass along these biblical truths to our kids, grandkids, any young person that we have in our sphere of influence, be it grandchildren, great-grandchildren, whatever. It's time to pass along what the Bible says because over the last 80 years, biblical prophecy has been being fulfilled at a faster rate of time than any other time period in history since Jesus walked the earth. The past 80 years, one prophecy after the other has been being fulfilled. And to understand biblical prophecy, the Bible says that we need to look to the east. What does that mean? We need to look to the east. So let's look at the scriptures today and see what God is telling us about the roles of Syria, Iran, Iraq, and China and Russia. Because these things that we're seeing on the news are amazing because they were foretold by the prophets of old. Revelation 16, 12 says that the kings of the east will march their armies west 
into the Middle East. This is a direct reference to China. The Middle East to us is the West to China. We've been hearing a lot over the last couple of years about China on the news, but there's a lot of things that you may not be aware of that's happening within that nation. But praise God, just as God promised in, his, in prophecy that there will be a, a great outpouring, God will send people into these dark nations, these godless nations. He will send people in to win the lost to Christ. There was a man named Hudson Taylor. Raise your hand if you know him. Powerful missionary. Very vocal missionary. And he felt the Lord was calling him to go to communist China at a time when that was very, very dangerous. He, he went there and he, he, the, it, it's, he was there 40 years. For 40 years, Hudson Taylor was on his knees praying for the people in this lost communist nation. He raised up over a thousand missionaries and over 1,100 nationals. He won to Christ, trained them, and then those, they went out throughout China and started churches and started winning the lost themselves. And to understand the depth of what that means, you got to understand the penalty in China at that time, and a lot of it's the same t today. If you were caught, if anyone was caught with a Bible in their possession, they were immediately, no trial, no magistrate, they were immediately taken aside and put to death by a firing squad. This is what was happening. This was the risk that Hudson Taylor knew that he was taking when he went in there. But his faith and his conviction was strong. He knew that the Lord had called him for this purpose, even though it could very well mean that he was giving his life. Can you imagine what the penalty would have been if you were caught starting a church or winning somebody to Christ? So Hudson Taylor, it said, because his faith and conviction and his obedience to God, China has 1.5 billion people living there. And it's estimated that a little more than 10% of China's population today are saved and serving Christ. To bring that into perspective, that's 150 million blood-washed, Spirit-filled, born-again Christians living and ministering in China today because of the conviction and obedience of one man. This is what it's going to take in this nation because we've always considered ourselves a Christian nation. We were founded that way. I don't care what some of these loony bins on the TV say today. We were founded upon the principles in the Word of God. And it's time that we get out of our easy chairs because there's more Christians living in the United States than anywhere else in the known world professing Christians. And God took one man, one Christian, into a Chinese society where there was no other Christians. And 150 million people got saved. Can you imagine what the Christians in the United States could do if we would just, we don't have to go to China unless God's calling you, but if you would just look across the room. All we have to do is look across the room, across the street, within our own families and see the lost and have the same conviction and obedience to God that he had. And we can win our families to Christ. Can I get an amen? amen. Jesus said... I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So why is it that the Bible, why, what, why China? Why is it that God is telling us in prophecy all those years ago, it's New Testament and you'll see it in the Old Testament too, to keep our eyes on China. Why? It's because of their role 
in the end times. It's because of China's role in end time prophecy. See, at the time the prophecy was spoken and written, China didn't have a great military. China wasn't a world superpower. A world superpower didn't exist. It was the Roman Empire from the New Testament. So why all those years ago is he saying to keep our eyes on China? Here's why. In 1964, China tested and detonated their first nuclear bomb. And 10 years later, they perfected a two and a half megaton bomb. That's 1974. Two and a half megaton bomb. Since then, they have perfected and tested a 1,000 megaton bomb. To bring that into perspective, the bombs that we dropped over Hiroshima and Nagasaki were less than, than two megatons. And you can go online right now and look at YouTube and watch what happened when those bombs went off. It shows ashes in the shape of people on bicycles. It vaporized people where they were instantly. CBS News did a study saying if a two and a half megaton bomb were to be detonated over Omaha, Nebraska, and they chose that because that's where the United States has their nuclear weapons. If one was detonated over the United States, it would vaporize three states instantly. Vaporize. Then the shock wave that would go out 360 degrees would create 1,000 mile an hour winds from coast to coast. Hurricane Katrina had 150 mile an hour winds. 1,000 mile an hour winds would level skyscrapers from coast to coast. These are truly dangerous times because at this moment, as I speak, China has thousands of these bombs in their arsenals. See, that did, didn't exist when the prophecy about them was given. People were thinking, well, what are they, they going to do? So God is telling us to keep our eyes on China. And today, you can see how they're posturing against Israel. We're going to see more of this. I'm gonna, hopefully, the Holy Spirit will bring it into focus. But this is dangerous. These are dangerous times. These times didn't exist when these prophecies were written. We are living in dangerous times. We are living in the last days. Now let's go back 1,500 years or 800 years to the prophet Zechariah. Could this be a vision that God gave to Zechariah? Could it be that it was nuclear war or something equivalent? I don't know, but let's read Zechariah 14, 12. And this shall be the plague which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. And we've got to realize at the time he wrote this prophecy, the only warfare that existed in his day were horses and chariots, bows and arrows and spears. And he writes of something like this. The people at that time were probably saying, oh, that'll never happen. But it's happening. That's why this description of what will happen to those who come against Jerusalem is so prophetic. And the enemies of Israel today have that capability. And it's not just China, India, Syria, the United States. We're not an enemy of Israel. We are in partnership with Israel. We better stay that way of a nation as a nation because this prophecy says all those who fight against Jerusalem. The enemies of Israel right now have that capability. In the Chinese government-run schools, kids are taught three main things. One, 
hate religion. It's a lie and it poisons people. Two, hate God. God's a lie. Three, hate all Western capitalism because it corrupts. They're taught of a world. These are, this is called indoctrination, and we can see it happening in our nation. When they start creating textbooks that go against the Word of God, and they're, they're feeding that systematically into our children, that's why I brought the children up at the beginning of this, because we're pouring the Word of God into them. There's a war, a spiritual battle being fought within those children, and they're not even yet to the age of accountability. And they're being indoctrinated. The kids in China from preschool through college are taught these three main principles. And they're taught of a future war that will be fought in the Middle East. Where China will be the victor and repopulate the earth. And create a new world order, a government where socialism and communism rule. A lot of Bible scholars believe that the red horse mentioned in the book of Revelation is speaking directly to China. Look at Revelation 16, 12. Look at this. This prophecy is astonishing. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great Euphrates River, and it dried up so that kings from the east could march their armies toward the west without hindrance. At the time this prophecy was given to John, he was in exile on the island of Patmos and Jesus was speaking these words into John saying, write this down. Jesus gave us this prophecy. And the reason it's so astonishing is because back then there was no, like I said, no United States, no big cities anywhere. There were small cities, what they considered a big city, we would seem like it would be more like a village or something like that. But at the time... Jesus gave this prophecy to John, this would seem far-fetched. But over the last 20 years, China has built dams. They've joined with Turkey, the, the nation. Not, you know, gobble, gobble. They've joined with the nation of Turkey and Syria. The Turks have built the Anaturk Dam, and the Syrians have dams, and the Chinese have dams. All along that within 24 hours, the Chinese government can dry up the Euphrates River. And get this, 18 years ago, they began to build a super highway. Super secret, nobody knew about it. You can go to Google Earth and look at it. You can do this research and I encourage you to. Because they've, the Chinese government have built an eight-lane super highway that leads directly in to the Middle East. Along the Euphrates River. And this prophecy is coming to pass. The enemies of Israel right now have the capability to dry up the Euphrates River because in order to invade the Middle East, that area is impassable by land, but now they've able, they're able to dry up the river and they've created a superhighway to make it happen. So they can dry up the river in Euphrates in 24 hours and their 280 million man army can march straight in to the Middle East. Chinese has more people in their army than we have living in the United States. They have more people in their army if they march their 280 million man army into the Middle East, into the tiniest nation of Israel, the tiniest, most vulnerable nation in the Middle East. Can you imagine? This is what Jesus said would happen, and we're watching it today. We are in the end times. The, I'm not trying to scare people. I'm not one of, uh, I'm a prophecy watcher. I'm a prophecy studier. But I've got to preach this message. I know I don't want it to sound like some sort of a lecture. But I'm telling you, you've got to hear this. You need to know this. We need to pass this along because it's happening before our very eyes. Can you see how on point the prophecy in Revelation is? And it goes on to say that the kings of the earth will join with the Chinese, with the kings of the east, and wage war against Israel. So you can watch the news and watch China, Syria, Iran, Iraq, and watch how they're posturing themselves, and Russia, and watch how they're posturing themselves against Israel. 
They are the kings of the east, mentioned in prophecy. Write down Ezekiel 38, chapter 38 and chapter 39. You can read it at home, but it mentions the other nations that are going to come into Israel from the north. That's Russia. And I want to say, God's not against any of the people in these nations. God's sending men like Hubs and women like Hudson Taylor into these places. Missionaries who say, I don't know why, I'm, I, I feel like i got to quit my job as an architect or whatever and go into ministry. And the families of these people are saying, you're crazy, you're crazy. But when God's calling you to do something and you know it in your heart, you've got to do it. Even if it means you lose some friends, even if it means you get called a cuckoo once in a while, you've got to follow where God is taking you. Because right now, God is leading Christian men and women into these lost nations that are mentioned in prophecy for the purpose of a harvest to lead them to Christ. That's why I brought up Hudson Taylor. So God's not against any of the people in these nations. He's talking about the wicked kings and governments that are posturing and that are going to come against Israel. Now look at Ezekiel's prophecy in Ezekiel 38. Let's read 1 through 5. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, Set your face against. In other words, keep your eye out for. Set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, which is Russia, Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal, I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses, and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them. See, God's calling them out by name. All of them with shield and helmet. Look at these nations God mentions by name in verse 4. Persia. Ancient Persia is Iran and Iraq. And we know that the Aitola of Iran is constantly chanting death to America and death to Israel. They're Iran's president a few years ago. What's his name? Ahmed Medina Jacket? or whatever. Anyway, Medinejad or whatever. He, Ahmed, whatever his name is, the president of Iran came to the United States. He went into the United Nations Hall and he stood at the podium and he said that Iran's main goal was to drive Israel into the sea and to wipe them off the face of the earth. He said it publicly. He said it in front of all the world's governments. So we know that Iran wants no more Nothing more than to see Israel wiped from the face of the earth. That's why I'm so glad that our president, think of him what you will. I'm not being political here, but I am so glad that our president stood up and got rid of that on your honor deal we had with Iran because that deal gave them an open door, unrestricted, to begin to develop the same type of weapons China has, the same 1,000 megaton bombs. They were on the path. The previous administration said, okay, go for it, and they, they were going to do it. And we stopped it. Praise the Lord. It seems crazy, but all of this is prophesied in your Bible. We can see God aligning it to happen exactly as he said it was going to happen. Back at a time when, the, like I said, when this place didn't even exist. Europe hadn't even been developed. And God's bringing it all in exactly how he said it would be. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I believe the reason that all these nations want to invade Israel 
and take control of the Middle East. Because right now Israel is the smallest, tiniest, most vulnerable nation, but it's got the most powerful army in the Middle East. And the reason that all these nations want to surround them and gather up on them, look at Ezekiel 38.10. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. At that time, He's talking about now. He's talking about in the future. And we're living it. At that time, meaning today, evil thoughts will come to your mind and you will devise a wicked scheme. You will say, Israel is an unprotected land filled with unwalled villages. I will march against her and destroy these people who live in such confidence. So what's the reason for their evil thoughts and their wicked schemes? Look at verse 12. To take a spoil and to take a prey. If you take SP away from spoil, you get oil. Could be because it lines up to take a prey, spoil, take a prey, to turn thy hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods, which is trade, that dwell in the midst of the land. Japan gets 100% of their oil from the Middle East. 85% of the oil in your, all the European nations come from the Middle East. Used to be 80% of ours, but thank you again, Lord, for a president who put a stop to that. Because five years ago, 80% of our oil came from the Middle East. Now, none of it does. But Russia gets about 80% of their oil from the Middle East. If you want to bring the world's military to a grinding heart, halt, and you want to bring all the world economies to a grinding halt, you do exactly what this is, Ezekiel prophesied. It would start by thinking an evil thought, then getting with other people that are like-minded and plotting other schemers and plotting a wicked scheme against the most powerful yet vulnerable country on earth in the Middle East, which is Israel. And you'd organize to devise a plan to conquer and take over Israel. A, get control of the most powerful military force in the Middle East, which is Israel. Then, use that force to take the spoil, to take the prey. Because if you can gain control of the world's oil, then you can bring any nation on this earth to a grunt. You can bring it to its knees. Any military force you can bring to its knees if you control the oil. Do you see how on point this scripture is? This is prophecy. It's in your Bible. And I've just took a few. I'd have to be here a week to show you all the prophecies about today. They're astonishing. There's two major there's one obstacle in their way, and that's Israel. And the Bible says that these nations will surround Israel, and they'll gather in the valley of Megiddo. Some of y'all have been there, and you've seen the great valley of Megiddo. And they will come against Israel. Look at these two major prophecies about the country of Israel. Deuteronomy 28, 64 says this, for the Lord will scatter, scatter you, meaning the people of Israel. For the Lord will scatter you among all the nations. From one end of the earth to the other. There you will worship foreign gods that neither you nor your ancestors have known. Gods made of wood and stone. So God is prophesying that someday this, these people, His people, the children of Israel, His nation would be scattered, taken off of their own land, and scattered all over the world. And they would begin to take on other uh, cultures and other gods, and they would begin to blend into societies from one end of the earth to the other. So God's saying, my people are going to be scattered. The Jews are going to be scattered all over the world. They're going to lose their place on the map. They're going to lose their physical location, their nation, and they're going to be scattered to the winds. Seventy years after Jesus ascended into heaven, Titus took his Roman army and he conquered, leveled the city of Jerusalem. And at that time, the people fled. A lot of them were taken captive, put in the slave trade, the human trafficking belt, 
and they were sent to all parts of the earth. Even though the people existed, they no longer existed in one place as a nation. So the prophecy was fulfilled. They were scattered. Centuries later, Adolf Hitler comes along. Some of y'all were alive when he was alive. Adolf Hitler comes along and he goes all through Europe and he gathers up as many Jews as he can and he kills them. He exterminates them, killing over six million Jews, only counting men. That didn't include the women and the children. Some people say it was up to 13 million Jews were exterminated by Adolf Hitler. And I believe that when the Lord took the prophet Ezekiel into the valley of dry bones, you remember that story? And he asked Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live again? Ezekiel said, Only you know, Lord. But if you look at the word valley, I challenge you, look at that story. Research the word valley in that context, in that specific context. And it means in Hebrew, a great ditch. And if you remember the films from World War II, when they exterminated these Jews, they would dig ditches and they would just bulldoze the bodies into these great ditches. And thousands of years before, God said to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, you see these valleys, these ditches full of dead bones? Can they live again? And Ezekiel said, only you know. God was talking about the Jewish people. He was talking about the Israelites in that scripture. And God said to him, speak a prophecy to the wind. This is the second time we heard speak a prophecy. That's a charge for you and I to speak a prophecy into the wind. So if you want to speak a blessing over your children, well, my kids are so messed up, I don't know what I'm going to do. No, no, speak a blessing over them. My son is going to get his act together. My daughter is going to get her life together. And they will be serving the Lord one day. Right now it seems dim and it seems bleak, but the Holy Spirit of God is going to breathe life into my wayward child one more time and they're going to live again. Speak it. Speak it. Believe it in the name of Jesus. And watch what God will do. Look at Ezekiel 37. We're going to read 10 and 11. God gives him a challenge and he says, Prophesy to the wind. Speak a prophecy, Ezekiel, that these bones shall live again. And In other words, God's saying, You do it. I'm calling one man. You. You. To speak a prophecy over these dead, dry bones. Hudson Taylor, I'm calling you. There's spiritually dead people living in a nation that I want to bring forth my people from. Speak a prophecy. I imagine when Hudson Taylor was on the boat heading for China. He was saying, in the name of Jesus, these people, God, you are going to protect me from the death, the sure death that awaits me as penalty for my deed. And I'm going to speak a blessing over the Chinese people that the breath, your breath, is going to blow through that nation. And out of those lost, dying, other God-worshipping people are going to come spirit-filled, blood-washed, born-again believers in the name of Jesus. I believe that Hudson Taylor spoke a prophecy over the people of China before he ever got there. So God is standing and he's saying to Ezekiel, I'm giving you the call. Speak a prophecy over these dead, dry bones. Speak a prophecy that they will live again. Ezekiel 37, 10 and 11. So I spoke the message as he, as God commanded me. Woo, here we go. And breath came into their bodies. And they all came to life and stood on their feet, a great army. He didn't just raise them from the ditch. He made them a great army. God always goes a step farther. So you, when we're speaking a prophecy over our children, we're saying, 
Lord, I speak a blessing over them that they will know You the way that You designed and created them to know You. When you speak that blessing, don't just say that. Say that they will walk in to what was prophesied over them. That they will become pastors and teachers and worship leaders. Not just Christians willing and able to sit on the pew in a comfort zone, but that they will be believers that are beyond what we know today. Build up my lost son and make him a minister, a pastor, an evangelist for the people of the end times. This is what we need to do with our lost loved ones. God is telling us right now, speak a prophecy over them. So Ezekiel did. They stood upon their feet a great army. Eleven. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying, we have become old, dry bones. All hope is gone. Our nation is finished. But when he spoke the prophecy over him, the Bible says, he listened. He spoke the prophecy. And from the valley, he heard a noise. And it was the bones beginning to rattle. And the earth beginning to quake. And the earth beginning to open up. And these bones began, they were all scattered and mixed together. And they began finding their way to their corresponding bone. Bone on bone. And then the Bible says that sinews muscle began to grow and skin began to grow and blood began to pump in their life and they not only lived they rose to become a great army again the people of israel by in 1942 were all but dead the majority of jews had either exiled and were worshiping other gods and didn't even know the story of their history And the others were being exterminated by a 20th century madman. These bones in this scripture represent the nation of Israel. And that's exactly what God did in 1948. By 1948, it looked like all hope was gone. They were scattered among the worlds just as God had said. And they were reduced in numbers by millions And it looked like all hope was gone for God's people. But in our lifetime, you can see it on film. The first time in history in the 21st, 20th century, we got to be able to see things on film. There's a reason for that. Because God doesn't want us to forget. You right now can go on your phone, where you're sitting, can go to YouTube, and you can look at the day that these Jews were liberated from their concentration camps, barely alive. The Jewish people said, all hope is gone. But God took them from that to look at them today. I was so proud of our president when he stood in Jerusalem and said, this shall be recognized by us as the capital of Israel. So the first, the first prophecy was that they'd be scattered. Here's the second. Look at Amos 9, 14, and 15. And we, these are two prophecies that are thousands of years old that we get to see on film. <laughs> the first one is they'd be scattered. Here's the second. Amos 9, 14, and 15 says, I will bring my exiled people of Israel back from distant lands and they will rebuild their ruined cities and live in them again. They will plant vineyards and gardens. They will eat their crops, drink their wine. I will firmly plant them in their own land. And here's my favorite part. Underline this in your Bible. They will never again be uprooted from the land that I have given them. So, if you're a leader in this world today, uh, this little preacher in Tennessee, I want to tell you, you guys need to look at this prophecy because God says that they shall never, ever again 
be taken from their land. This is the prophecy that the leaders of China, Syria, Russia, Iran, Iraq need to read carefully because their lives are on the line, not God's people's lives. Amen? They will never again be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Hallelujah. This is the oldest real estate contract in history. Amen? And because we can see it happening, we can see it coming to pass. When I was a kid, nobody ever told me that what I was watching in those old newsreels was prophecy. I thought it was a great story about people being restored after World War II. And I thought it was horrible what happened to the Jews. But I would have loved to have had somebody in my life that new prophecy that would sit me down and say, Rob, this is biblical prophecy being fulfilled. You can see it with your own eyes. This is what we need to do for our generation of children. We need to say, look at what God has done. And when they start thinking biblically as they're watching the news and they see China posturing and they see that super highway being built along the Euphrates River that leads straight into Israel and you see Syria and Turkey building dams and China that can dry up the Euphrates River. Remember the sixth bowl, the sixth angel poured out his bowl. And if you know Revelation, you'll know how close to the end the sixth bowl being poured out is. Look at God's instructions for us. Okay, pastor, that's great. I get it. I see it. What in the world does that do with me? Okay, I'll, I'll find it and research it and I'll study your word and I'll, and I'll teach my children and my grandchildren about it. But what, what does it have to do with me? What can I do about it? Romans 13, 11 through 14. This is God's instruction for us. This is all the more urgent. How often do you see that word in Scripture? About six times. Urgency. Meaning, emergency. When they wrote this verse, when Paul wrote this verse to the church in Rome, when he wrote this letter to the church in Rome, there were sirens going off. It was an emergency letter. It was an urgent text. This is all the more urgent for you to know how late it is. Time is running out. First thing to underline, wake up, for your salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark, dirty, your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on shine, the shining armor of right living because we belong to the day we must live decent lives what for all to see in other words live your Christian life out loud be a red shirt in a camouflage world live it out loud don't hide it for the time is urgent Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Here we go. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties, drunkenness, or in sexual promiscuity, and immoral living, or in quarreling, and jealousy. He's talking to Christians. Christians. Instead, clothe yourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. God's giving this generation, you and I, of believers, three specific commands in this scripture. First, wake up. It's time for the church to spiritually wake up and realize where we are to get our spiritual bearings and know what God expects of us in these times. The second thing is clean up. Clean up your living. Take sin off the table. Remove it. We've all got a sinful option. 
The Bible says through every temptation, the Holy Spirit has made a door of escape. We have no excuse. Oh, Lord. My friends just came around and first they jammed a whiskey bottle into my mouth and, and then they made me watch the dancers on the pole. And then someone came along and stuck a doobie in my mouth and I just couldn't help it. It's all their fault, God. No! He's saying, wake up! Clean up! It's your responsibility and my responsibility to remove the sin option from every aspect of our lives. And He's promised a door of escape through any temptation. There's nothing we can't handle in the name of Jesus. And the third thing in this verse He's commanding the church is to look up. The Bible says, lift up your heads for redemption draweth nigh. Our time is at hand. We are living in the last days, like it or not. It's not time to fluff up the church. It's not time to present pop psychology and easy believism. The time is to open the Word, review the prophecy, Stick to the word. Don't omit it because you have gay people in your life that it'll offend. Don't omit it because you have drunkards and potheads and sexually promiscu pro promiscuous people in your life. Do not admit it. I mean, omit it. <laughs> do not admit it. <laughs> See, that's what the devil wants you to not do. Do not omit telling the truth of God's word. Wake up. Clean up. Look up. Because our time is here. One last prophecy about today as we stand. Paul wrote this on his, die on his deathbed. Paul was dying. He was passing along the mantle. See, it's hard for a pastor to pass along the mantle. But every pastor has to go through that. That's why we must remain on our knees because God is going to bring somebody into our midst one day and God is going to command me to hand the mantle to that person. Sometimes pastors are stubborn They've worked real hard. They don't even feel like they got the momentum that they feel they deserve. And yet God says it's time. That's why we need to put away our prideful thoughts. What's in it for me? And we need to say, God, thy will, not my will. This is where Paul was. And he writes to Timothy, he's passing the mantle to his young protege. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, he's talking about today, and why is he telling him? Because the Lord wasn't going to come in Timothy's day. He's telling Timothy so Timothy could pass it on to the next one, to the next one. To the next one. And here we are today, 2,000 years later, reading the Word of God that somebody cared enough to pass along through the generations. That's again why I call on fathers. That in the last days, there will be very difficult times for people will love only themselves and their money. See, this kind of society did not exist in that day. They will only love themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents. Even that was like, no way. And ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. Hmm. Have you been watching the news the last three months? They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel. They will hate what is good. They will betray their friends. 
They will be reckless to puff up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will, here we go, underline this, they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. When Jesus talks about the Laodicean church, it's a church that has a form of godliness. They gather, they sing, they pray, they worship. But they deny the power, the only power, that can make them godly, which is the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Any church who refuses to talk about the Holy Spirit because they say, oh, that Holy Spirit stuff's old-fashioned and it's off-putting to people. Pray for those churches because they're sending their people to hell. Because if we don't teach it in the church, how are they going to know that it takes the Holy Spirit of God in our lives to give us the power to become godly in His sight? We can act godly all day long. That's easy. We got that down. But we have to be welcoming, praying for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Pray that God will fill us with the Holy Spirit according to His will and His way. If you'd like to support this church, this ministry, you want to honor the Lord with the worship of tithe and offering, you can go to servantsheartworshipcenter.com. You can do it online. You can click the donate tab at the top of the home page. Then go down and click the yellow donate button. Type in the amount you want to donate. Then either click the PayPal and use your PayPal account or the debit and credit card button and follow the instructions from there. Or if you'd like to send in a check, you could send uh, your tithe and, and offering to Servants Heart Worship Center at P.O. Box 1859. Spring Hill, Tennessee, 37174. I love you all so much. God bless you.